Greetings, this is Griff Ruby, the Nostalgic Catholic, with another Isaac Asimov short story review. This one is contained in Future Science Fiction, to be precise, the November 1950 issue. So, let's see what we've got in here. Let's just get a quick look, because it didn't get mentioned on the cover. But it does have mentioned inside. Let's see here. There it is. The table of contents. Day of the Hunters. Isaac Asimov and it's page 74. There's even a little blurb here. So some of the bigger zines sometimes seem to still keep the border of the digest size, but generally don't. And it says, Day of the Hunters, Isaac Asimov, 74. Solving the mystery of what happened to the great dinosaurs poses a bitter question. So, we'll quickly take a look at the story. It's on page 74. It starts here. And once again, there's the story by Isaac Asimov, a little blurb. And there's a nice little piece of artwork here with a little blurb of its own. Let's get back to that in a moment. Let's start with the, the title and uh, it says here. Day of the Hunter by Isaac Asimov. The little old man had a new slant on the mystery of what really happened to the great dinosaurs. <laughs> it looks like this dinosaur theme has kind of come up again because that was in the, what was that, Darwinian pool room story? Yeah, okay. So now it's once again, that was kind of a side light. Now it's like the main feature. Then there's this drawing. Okay, now let's take a look at the drawing here. Well, the blurb says, Carol sent me back to the age of the big reptiles, and there were little lizards with energy guns hunting them. So, illustration by LaRose, whatever that is. Okay, so that must be Carol. A little bit of eye candy there. And in the background, you see the guy in some sort of weird... That's supposed to be the time machine. And then up in this corner here, this is what he saw. Here's these dinosaurs. If you look closely, they've got ray guns. They've got steel belts for holsters to put the guns into. And supposedly, the, these dinosaurs are about four feet tall. Walk up right on two feet, but they also have tails. And... Uh, have evolved enough intelligence to uh, have, you know, invented ray guns and technology with which to hunt themselves. So, or each other, or hunt for a different uh, game. Well, that's kind of interesting. A little shot of Saturn there in the background. I'm not sure what that's doing there, but okay. That's the only artwork associated with the story. I should also point out that apart from the artwork and those couple of uh, publisher blurbs, there is, I did not discern any difference between the story as printed there originally and as published in by Jupiter. So, the story appears in there and it also appears as Day of the Hunters. So, let's see, Day of the Hunters, page 14. Yeah. So, there it all is. And basically, you start off with a little conversation, you know, these people in a bar, and somehow they start talking to somebody at the neighboring table, and next thing you know, they are arguing about how the dinosaurs have died off. And one guy said, well, I made this time machine, but uh, I've destroyed it. And uh, it's like, oh, really, why would you do that? I mean, I mean, if you had a time machine, you could, you know, find out what stocks are going to go up, and who's going to win all the next, you know, whatever, sports contests, elections, you name it, and be able to place absolutely infallible bets on all of them and make a huge amount of money that way. But, no, you're just going to destroy it. Yeah, right. Okay. But he says, well, I had to because of what I found out. Well, okay. He went back all these millions of years in the story with a little help from the lady named Carol, who gets operated the machinery and send him back. And then I guess to bring him back to now or something. So he goes to that time and he sees these dinosaurs and they're zapping other dinosaurs. Now, 
There's a lot of interesting things. These dinosaurs seem to have brains that are about the size of cat brains. But there's this whole thing where, well, but we don't, well, we only use about a fifth of our brains. These dinosaurs are using 100%. Oof. We see that surfing from, surfacing from time to time in Asimov's story. Matter of fact, it actually surfaces in the foundations, in this foundation series where it's saying, well, instead of 20%, it's saying 10% or some smaller figure our brain gets used, but the mule uses more of it somehow, and, you know, that's, uh, okay. That seems to be, you know, that and this kind of story you know, it seems to be where it's, oh, we only use, you know, I mean, empty out 10%, 20%, whatever, 5% of our brains, and the rest is just hanging there doing nothing, apparently. Which isn't really true. It may not be doing anything totally obvious. You might even be able to function reasonably well with some fairly significant amount of your brain surgically removed. But it's not that there's all this brain in there that's not doing anything. I mean, it's all doing something. So, anyway, these critters have these kitten sized brains. They uh, are attacking the other dinosaurs because they like to hunt them. Um, there's the time machine, the guy goes back, gets out of the situation one way or another. Uh, in this case, the, the dinosaurs involved, um, were ready to um, kill him too. I mean, he was kind of an interesting thing to them because they hadn't seen any other intelligent species before, yet somehow they could just tell that <coughs> this human being suddenly thrown back a million years is, in fact, obviously a fellow intelligent creature. There's a little bit of commentary about how many buffalo we wiped out and you know, all these other kind of stuff. Very kind of familiar in a way. It tries to moralize. But there's some there's some kind of neat things in there too. Like I mean how many skeletons really survive? I mean think about the dinosaurs, you know, ruled the earth for literally hundreds of millions of years. And they were all over, and they must have you know, just zillions of them. But how many skeletons will survive? You know, I don't know, maybe a hundred or less. I mean, it, it, you know, certainly less than two hundred. You know, sufficiently intact skeletons to have any idea what the creature might have looked like or even been. So, I mean, there's almost nothing. How many of them lived and died and disappeared? And their bones are such complete dust that they will never, ever be reassembled. So, obviously, an extremely small percentage of all of them would survive. So, you could, there could be dozens, hundreds, thousands of species of these things. These are big, significant dinosaurs that will never know a single thing about because, for whatever reason or another, not a single skeleton remained. Indeed, the comment is made that, well, these critters here are way too smart to just fall into a mud flat or whatever, um, or a tar pit or, you know, however fossils end up being made. Mm, okay, I don't know. Human beings do sometimes have the same misadventure, so I'm not really quite sure how that's supposed to be. But, again, you consider how very few human remains there are. That's kind of the same thing. So, anyway... They're about to eat him, and then they see something else more interesting, and they decide to go after that instead. And off they go, and he goes back to his time machine, and and uh, somehow it's time to bring him back, and he comes back to the now, and goes, now I know what happened to the dinosaurs. And it's a commentary, because if they're, you know, it's one kind of dinosaur gets smart enough to enjoy hunting all the others to their extinction, and it ends with them... A little commentary on them, with nothing left to hunt, they start hunting each other. So, you got to remember, this story is was originally written a long time ago. It was written at a time when it was going on in Nazi Germany. It was still very fresh in the minds of everybody, where you've got these people who really literally are hunters, not only of animals, but of fellow human beings. So... That actually seems like a very reasonable and feasible thing to say. Humanity will destroy everything else, and then when it runs out of other things to hunt, it will hunt itself until it's to extinction. And that's what will happen. And so that's what happened to the dinosaurs, and therefore that is what could happen to us. That's the 
demoralizing, kind of heavy and uncalled for. And of course, as we know, it really was a media riot and it wasn't anything like this. That isn't to say that it couldn't have evolved some dinosaur that was intelligent. I've always thought it'd be kind of fascinating to come across some dinosaur skeleton and discover clear evidence of ancient dental work on its teeth or something. You know, or some such thing, you know. <laughs> but, I mean, of all the human fossils that could be found, say, 230 million years from now, you know, what's to say even one of them would show dental work, even though many of us have had dental work, but proportionately how many, you know, less. But there's a cute line, though, that does kind of remind me in this thing. It says, uh, you look at the skeleton, and how, how do you know whether or not they even had a technology? You might even have that the bones of that particular dinosaur, but we don't notice because the cranium's like, you know, got this room for a brain the size of a cat's, and, you know, but none of its machinery would have lasted. That, that stuff would have long since rusted away, disappeared, and there'd be just no evidence of it, nothing. So, for all those millions of years, you're, you're lucky you got the bones. So, it could have happened that way, too. Uh, so, but looking at the skeletons, I mean, if, for example, a human skeleton and a gorilla skeleton, you know, would have survived, you know, 230 million years from now, and some intelligent species would have discovered these ancient, ancient dinosaur-like skeletons from a much later era than the original dinosaurs, you know, would it know which one invented the atom bomb? And which one of them ate bananas in the zoo? <laughs> and I like that. <laughs> you know, here's a human skeleton, here's a gorilla skeleton. And you tell me which one of these, just looking at the skeleton, invented the atom bomb, and which one of these uh, ate bananas at the zoo. So, yeah, it's got some good imagery like that. So, it, it, it has some fun moments. The preachiness, of course, is uh, maybe a bit overdone. But you get the idea. It's science fiction. This story in particular, however, has a background that's of some interest. I pointed out that the story as published in By Jupiter is, so far as I can tell, I mean, maybe if I really went through a scanner, I might catch some typographical difference, but I didn't notice any reading on it. You know, right back to back between that and how it appeared on the pages of future science fiction. But there is, however, a significantly different text of this. In the early Asimov, there are listed 11 early stories of his that were regarded as lost. One of them had subsequently been found while he was doing his autobiography titled The Weapon. I did a review on that commensurate with the fact of the time that that story had come out without Asimov's name on it, but somebody else, but it was his The Weapon story. And so I just did that in sequence. But the other one that was missing there, but it's turned out not to be missing, was a story called Big Game. In the early Asimov, Big Game was listed as the uh, last of the stories that would be lost. Um, but... In the early 70s, after the early asthma came out, somebody decided to go through all his papers, which Boston University was holding on to every scrap of paper that ever went through his house, I think. They had everything. I mean, I would love to see what might exist in the early drafts of Lucky Star and the Snows of Pluto, or The Bounds of Eternity, which was to be the fourth no, the third Elijah Bailey novel, abandoned after I think about maybe three or four chapters. It would be interesting to see, you know, where these kinds of things would have gone if, having decided he's done pretty much with fiction and now wants to just write fact, he's not going to write any more novels. Uh, this also comes at the time he had written A Whiff of Death or The Death Dealers, if you could take the title. And it didn't sell very well. He couldn't sell it to Doubleday when they were willing to take all kinds of things from him just because they had his name. But they weren't willing to take that one. I mean, even name recognition wasn't enough. 
and he ends up having to sell it to Avon, who, you know, <laughs> put a totally unfitting cover on the book as a paperback, <laughs> you know. So, and only 10 years later, he finally got it moved up to another publisher called Walker. And I was finally gave us the hardcover edition, albeit significantly edited. I talk about that one when I reviewed that book already a long time ago. So, that had gone very sour for him. That soured him on trying to write any more novels. He kind of lost interest in trying to do The Bounds of Eternity, so that petered out, like I said, after about three or four chapters. And the Snows of Pluto, I have no idea what progress is going to be made on that before that too was abandoned. It was going to be his seventh Lucky Star novel. But, you know, again, all of this was abandoned. Um, and he concentrated on fact, and so there's a trickle of short stories that continue to come out for a few years, but it's a, after how much in the 50s, it is not just a trickle. So, Big Game, as it turns out, was not lost. So, like I said, somebody went through all his papers, and they found among those papers, Big Game. And he talks about it, and in this book, I only have the, without the cover, unfortunately, Before the Golden Age, Isaac Asimov, a science fiction anthology of the 1930s. Collected and with autobiographical introduction by Isaac Asimov. So, this is, you know, for the early Asimov is the story of the story of him writing stories. This is the story of those stories that most impressed him in the ten years immediately prior to when he started writing his own stories. So that's actually pretty cool when you think about it. But the stories, unfortunately, I mean, at least his have some interest. And it turns out that Big Game was found. Let me just read what it's got here. It's kind of cool. So, okay. I cannot resist the insertion at this point. I'm on page 809 in here. Okay. At this point, I have a short, short story of my own, only 1,000 words long, so forgive me, which was written in the spirit of disenchantment you find in Devolution, which is, okay, that's the story that's in here. Uh, Devolution, which was by... Edward Hamilton, by the way. And I guess one of the stories that he particularly liked when he saw it. So he comments on it, says how much he liked it, and he produces the story here. Okay. So, devolution. My story, entitled Big Game, was written on November 18, 1941, just about five years after I read Devolution. I mentioned Big Game in the early Asimov, page 366, as the last of the 11 science fiction stories I had written but had been unable to publish. In that book, I said, I wish I could remember what Big Game was about. The title, however, recalls nothing to my mind, and the story now no longer exists. But apparently, it did indeed exist. I have been handing material to Boston University, as I mentioned earlier in this book, and among some old manuscripts I hadn't looked through, there was one of the never-published Big Game. After the early asthma of appear, some fan of mine, poking through some of the material in Boston University Library, and with permission, came across the manuscript, had it Xeroxed, and sent a copy to me. So here it is, the only story of mine that exists, as far as I know, perhaps I had better not be too sure by myself anymore, but has never till now been published. Okay, and then he has the actual text of the game, which just runs literally three pages. And it all ends with the same thing, and yet... Perhaps it's not important that a few of my stories have never been published. I suspect that I waste nothing. For instance, once I read, once I reread Big Game, I realized that I had made use of the plot and expanded it into Day of the Hunters, which appeared in the November 1950 Future Fiction. That story, however, never appeared anywhere else. Because by Jupiter had yet come out, it come out later that year or next year. Never anywhere else, even in the early Asimov which traced my career only through 1949, so I doubt that its existence disturbs the novelty, if any, of Big Game. And then he goes on to other stuff. So, and it's interesting to look at the text of Big Game. It is very substantially the same story. It has these dinosaurs with brains the size of cat brains, you know, where they use 100% and we only use a, a fifth of our brains. It has him going back in a time machine, 
Carol's not in the story, though. He just goes back by himself somehow. Goes back to the time of the di dinosaurs disappearing. He sees these dinosaurs zapping each other. Nothing about the ray gun holster, so. And um, sees them going after big game. Um... There's so much in common. Then he comes back and then he wonders what happened after that. Well, obviously they hunted themselves after they hunted for everything else. And even in that time, once again, they were interested in this fellow uh, intelligent being. Uh, in Big Game, there's a kind of a telepathy that somehow he could see what they were about. They could see what he was about. That's why he was kind of interesting and impressive to them. But then they saw something else and they went after that and forgot about it. And that gave him the opportunity to go back to his time machine, come back to the present, and say, well, I saw what happened. This particular dinosaur came along, same size, same stature, tail, about four feet tall, um, ray gun, all of it. What I should say. And there it was. So it really is so much. I could even start with a discussion in a bar where the people at one table are talking to somebody at another table, you know, and the other person there, yeah, I made a time machine, but I destroyed it afterwards. You know, a little less discussion about how silly that would be. But, you know, because remember, this is only a thousand words, so it's very short. But it is so very much the same story. It's almost a retread. So, it's kind of interesting. And this gives me a chance to cover this story. If I were to wait for the proper sequence, I'd have to go all the way till 1974 when it finally came out in print for the first, last, and only time in this uh, Before the Golden Age book of his. So, but since it's an early story, and especially since the story as a story essentially is out in November of 1950 as the Day of the Hunters, it seems reasonable to cover this one other early, early story at this point in time. So, just to kind of keep stock, um, a few early, a couple early fantasies had to wait until 1950 to come out to be written in the early 40s. The weapon had come out right away, but then seemed to be lost and rediscovered for his autobiography. Big game it was lost, but not really. But at any rate, the concept of it, in a surprisingly large amount of detail, was remembered and reused for Day of the Hunter, and so. Which, so I'm covering that now, leaving only two other stories to surface later. One is titled First Law, it'll be in the rest of the robots, but that came out in 1956. And the other one being Author, Author, another fantasy that doesn't see the light of day until 1964, and then again in the early So we've just about, with this, we have therefore, other than Author, Author, and First Law, we have finished all the stories that are actually in the early Asimov or from that era with just those exceptions. So it's kind of neat to finally just, just wrap this one up now rather than wait till covering 1974. So anyway, thank you for listening.